In today's video, I'm gonna show you how to dither with the Skyguider Pro or Star Adventure and the ASAR Pro. This is what's gonna control everything and it makes the process fairly simple, but there are some important things you need to keep in mind. First, let's explain what dithering actually does. If you were to turn this on in the ASIR Pro's menu, then after every single photo you take, the star tracker and ultimately your camera are gonna move very slightly. And what you're gonna notice on the screen is that the stars move between every single photo. That's what we're really trying to do because a lot of our sensors have color model and hot pixels, banding, purple glow, whatever it is. And theoretically, by having the stars move after every single exposure, when they all get lined up back to the same spot, that'll smooth out, especially the color model. It'll fix the hot pixels. It might reduce banding and a lot more. And before we go any further, I wanted to mention that my big 2020 update for the Deep Space course has been completed. You should have gotten an email by now if you purchased the course with the new link. If not, send me an email, make sure you get it. If you don't have the Deep Space course yet, you might want to check it out, especially if you're using a Skyguider Pro or Star Adventure, because we cover a lot of different topics, mainly how to find, photograph, and edit 12 of the best deep space objects for those with a star tracker and a DSLR. So you can check that out on my website if you're interested, but let's get back to the dithering right now. As I mentioned earlier, today we're going to focus on the ASAR Pro workflow, but you can also do this if you have PHD2 and Backyard EOS or Backyard Nikon installed on your laptop. The interface and the workflow is going to be a little bit different, but the same concepts will still apply. As you would expect, the first thing we need to do is get out there on location and do a basic polar line by just using our polar scope. This shouldn't take you more than 10 minutes if you know what you're doing. Once you've done your basic polar alignment though and you've got things looking fairly good, make sure your tripod is nice and stable and secure. Now we can attach our counterweights, our declination bracket, and even our camera and lens. With your camera and lens securely attached to the declination bracket, now you can go grab the ASAR Pro, your portable battery, the various cables, and your auto guider and guide scope. If you're still a beginner and you're a little bit confused right now, I recommend you go back and watch some of my earlier auto guider videos here on YouTube or check out that deep space course. Either way, I'm assuming if you're watching this video, you at least know the basics. All right, let's finally get into this. So by now you've attached all your cables, you've turned on the battery, you've turned on the ASAR Pro. The ASAR Pro is generating its own Wi-Fi network, which you can connect to on your smartphone. You shouldn't really have any troubles right here. And once you are connected to the ASAR Pro's Wi-Fi, now we can go back to the application and start it up. But for a lot of us, especially on Android, we might have a problem where it cannot detect the ASAR Pro, which makes no sense. We're connected to the Wi-Fi network. It should be able to find it. But let's see what happens here. Yeah, no ASIR detected. That happens to me a lot, but there's a very simple fix. If you just bring down your top tab here, swipe over to the right in my case, we're gonna turn off our mobile data LTE connection. For whatever reason, that causes problems. Now that I've disabled my LTE, it says we're connected and we're ready to move on. This would be a good time to mention you need to have your DSLR connected to the ASAR Pro via USB cable and your DSLR has to be supported. If your DSLR is not supported, then you cannot dither with the ASAR Pro. What I'd like you to do is head over to their website, go to the products tab and then click ASAR Pro because maybe you're watching this six months from now and they might have added some new cameras. When you make it to the ASAR Pro product page, we'll scroll down until we see this chart right here. And right now, they mainly have Canon and Nikon cameras that are compatible. If you have a Sony or Fuji, I don't think they will work. It's worth a shot, but again, chances are it's not going to work properly and you cannot dither. For tonight's example, I'm using the Nikon D750, which I know will work, but I also have the Nikon D780. That one is not even currently listed here, and I think I've tried it before and it doesn't work. So again, make sure your camera is compatible. If not, you have a few alternate things you can do. First, you're going to need to download PHD2. This is a free application for both Windows and Mac, and this is what's going to control your guiding and ultimately your dithering. So you'll need this application, and then if you're on Canon, you can try Backyard EOS. This is going to be your image acquisition software, and that's what's going to allow you to focus, set your camera settings, see a live preview, and more. But in order to do dithering, you need to have both an image acquisition software like Backyard EOS or Backyard Nikon, and PHD2, and they need to be able to communicate with one another on your laptop. 
I'll save that for somebody else to cover because I would rather do things much easier and just control everything from my smartphone. But again, the big problem here is that if you don't have a supported camera model, you're kind of out of luck and you cannot dither on the ASAR Pro. Getting back on track, my camera and the ASAR Pro are connected via a USB cable. And more importantly, the camera needs to be on bulb mode. If you're on full manual on Nikon, you can just scroll past 30 seconds and it will say bulb. For some Canon shooters, you might have a B there on your top dial. That'll be bulb mode for you. And also, it's really important that you put your aperture to wide open. If you look closely there, you see with mine was set to F8, but you cannot change the aperture here in the ASAR Pro app. So make sure right now you just put it to wide open, whether that's F5, F4, whatever it is, and you'll be good to go. If you've done everything correctly and the camera's turned on, you should now be able to select it as your main camera. Moving down, we have the main scope focal length, which you're gonna need to put in something here. In my case, I'm using a 150 to 600 millimeter lens. I put in 600 millimeters to start, but thinking back, I probably should just put it to 150. Everything else should be good. Your mount is gonna be on camera ST4 because you're using a Skyguider Pro or Star Adventure. The guide scope and all that's already been figured out. Everything looks set to go. Now I'll click enter and we're gonna be in our main camera shooting interface. I'm gonna go through this process fairly quickly today because I'm assuming you've done this a few times and you're comfortable using the application. First, we need to take our test photos, usually three to 10 seconds long, and I'm zoomed out at 150 millimeters. When the image completes, I wanna zoom in and verify that the stars are sharp and I have Polaris near the center of the frame. Both of those need to be done before we can do our polar alignment here in the ASA or Pro. So there's our preview image. We see Polaris almost dead center, that looks good. And if I pinch and zoom on the screen, I can just make sure the stars are fairly sharp. Everything looks fine. Next, I'm gonna click the camera icon up top. And from here, we can adjust all of our different camera settings. You can change the focal length, which that's actually the first thing I need to do. It needs to be 150 millimeters, just to make sure everything's working properly. The ISO, you can adjust freely here in the application because your camera will probably be unresponsive. Just make sure you're not choosing a value that your camera can't actually do. Like my Nikon D750 can't go as high as like 51,000 or whatever it was. For these test photos, you can be anywhere from 3,200 to 12,800. That works fairly well. In my case, I'm gonna stick with 3,200. Also really important here, save images to DSLR simultaneously because if something happens to the AS Air Pro, you're gonna lose the photos if that's not checked. I always like to have a raw copy saved on the DSLR itself. Really, that's all you have to worry about here in your main camera settings. And in this case, I'm just gonna change my main scope focal length, as I mentioned, to 150 millimeters. This is important when you're doing your plate solving, which is what we're gonna to need to do for our polar alignment. And that'll make more sense here in a minute. So just verify that's correct. We know our stars are sharp. We've got Polaris pretty much dead center in the screen. And if you've got both of those things done, then you can continue on with the polar alignment steps. If you're ready to go, we're gonna click preview in gold over there on the right and change that to PA for polar align. Once we're in our polar alignment interface, you don't really wanna have the star tracker turned on just yet, you can leave it turned off. And then you can click the play button on the right. Make sure your exposure is three seconds, that tends to work well. Since we're using a Skyguide or Pro or Star Adventure, we have a manual mount, so we're gonna hit skip. And now it's gonna take our first image. This is why I stress you need to have Polaris dead center in the frame, more or less, and the stars need to be sharp, otherwise it's gonna fail right here. In my case, it's able to solve in, in just two seconds. Now it wants me to rotate 60 degrees, so I'll hit next. It's still saying rotate 60 degrees and it says rotate it at the bottom. What I'd like you to do now is go loosen your clutch, turn your entire camera and lens down about 60 degrees, tighten down your clutch, and then you can come back here to the application. Provided you've turned everything roughly 60 degrees, you can hit rotate it here in the application. And now we'll tell your camera to take another photo. You shouldn't have any problems here. It should just plate solve and work. If you do have problems, you might wanna just restart everything and try again. In my case though, it's gonna solve here. And now we have to hit let's go at the bottom. Now we're finally ready to make our adjustments. And all you really have to pay attention to are the numbers and the arrows on the right below that kind of frowny face. We've got down 16 minutes, 59 seconds, to the right, five minutes, 58 seconds, for a total error of 17 minutes and 38 seconds. All you really have to do is adjust your azimuth and altitude adjustment screws on your base and get those numbers as low as possible. I recommend starting off with one 
in this case, let's say the down. Try and get the down as close to zero as possible and then work on your left and right. In this case, it took me about, I think, five to 10 minutes just because I was having some trouble, but it shouldn't take you much more than that. When I eventually got it down to about three arc minutes, that was close enough for me, and I just hit stop because I figured, you know what, I spent enough time on this, let's get going. Once you've done your pole alignment, though, you can either wait until you get the smiley face or stop it if you think you've got it close enough. We'll go back to our preview window, and now what we need to do is find and center the object that we want to photograph. Depending on your skill level, the amount of light pollution, how comfortable you are finding objects manually, and your focal length, this can take you anywhere from 30 seconds to an hour. And this is another reason I'd recommend you check out my Deep Space course. We go into how to actually find all these objects, and it should make your life a lot easier. As you're going to see today, I was able to get Andromeda pretty much in the middle of the frame on my very first try. And the reason I was able to do it so quickly is because I know how to find the object, I'm at a wide focal length, and I just look through my lens. Because I'm in a fairly dark sky, I could actually see a very faint smudge, and because I was aimed up where I thought Andromeda was, I knew that smudge had to be the galaxy. And now with our first test photo, we should see it here on the screen. Most of you are going to have a lot more trouble at this stage, so let me give you some tips that might help you out. Rather than doing this in the ASAR Pro, I'd actually recommend doing it the old-fashioned way, just using your DSLR as normal. Because here in the application, you can only shoot 10 or 30 seconds. I'd rather be able to shoot 15, 20, 25, whatever I want. It's also much more cumbersome to focus here in the ASR Pro because you have to make a small adjustment, take a photo, make a small adjustment, take a photo. You can't actually focus in real time, at least not with my DSLR here. It doesn't work well. So that'd just be one more reason why I would say pull out that USB cable from your DSLR and just do this next step manually. So take your photos, find the object, get it centered up, get the stars nice and sharp, and then after you've done all that, you can reconnect the USB cable and continue on because frankly, I just think the app makes it harder. You're free to do whatever you want though. And the main goal again is just to get your object centered up in the frame at a wide field of view, and then we can zoom into whatever focal length we plan on shooting at. In my case, 600 millimeters. So you can zoom into 600 after you've got it centered up in the frame. Don't forget to put it here in the main camera settings as well. Then we could click off to the left, get back to our shooting interface, and take another photo. If you haven't turned on your star tracker yet, you'll want to do that right now. That way you don't have star trails. And you'll notice that Andromeda is off to the left. So now what I want to do is adjust my right ascension and my declination until I can get that dead center. This is going to be very difficult though at 600 millimeters because a very small adjustment could even throw it completely out of the frame. In my case, I spent about 10 minutes just trying to move Andromeda a little bit to the right. It's that much of a pain. One thing that can really help though is using your arrow keys on your Skyguider Pro or Star Adventure. That's going to ultimately move Andromeda in this case, either up or down, left or right, depending on the orientation. For those on the Skyguider Pro, you just want to hold down your left or right arrow for up to maybe one second and then take another photo. That should move it plenty. If you went the wrong way, hold down the other arrow key. If you're using a Star Adventure though, your arrow keys go a lot slower. So you actually have to press and hold on one of your arrow keys for up to maybe five seconds before the stars will noticeably move. Then you can take a photo. Again, it's the same thing if they went the wrong way. Press and hold down your other arrow key for maybe up to 10 seconds. It's just more of a pain. In this case, I had to adjust my declination and that's really hard to do because you have to do it manually. And it went too far to the right. Then I'll move it back to the center. Again, you have to just mess around with this and eventually you will get the object centered up in the frame and then you can worry about focusing again. After I got Andromeda centered up in the frame, I zoomed in and I realized my stars were no longer sharp and I needed to focus them. You can try using the focus option here in the ASIR Pro, but it does a really terrible job with my camera. It's completely useless. Rather than doing it this way, as I mentioned earlier, pull out that plug, turn on live view on your DSLR and focus the old fashioned way where you find a bright star, zoom in on it, turn your focus ring back and forth until the star is as small as possible. Then you can reattach the USB cable and continue on. Now that your stars are looking sharp, you can plug back in your USB cable, come back here to the app, hit OK, and then we need to go back and reselect our main camera. So I'll click the camera icon up at the top of the screen, choose my Nikon D750 from the dropdown, and make sure I hit the little switch to turn it on. It's now going to tell you to put your camera on manual mode with bulb as your shutter speed, which you should have already done, so that's already taken care of, and we'll just hit OK. 
After all that hard work, we're finally ready to get into our dithering settings. So just take one more photo, make sure your stars are nice and sharp and your object is centered up in the frame. At that point, we're gonna head over to our auto guider settings, begin our calibration, figure out our dither settings, and then finally begin taking our images. To get to our guiding interface, we're gonna click the guide button over on the left. That'll bring up a chart. Just double click on the chart and it will bring you to the guiding interface, which we see right here. First, I'd like you to click on the telescope icon at the top of the screen. We need to verify that on-camera ST4 is selected and the switch is turned on. This is for everybody with the SkyGuider Pro or Star Adventure. If that looks good, we can now go to our guide settings. Thankfully, the guide settings are pretty straightforward. Just make sure your camera is selected and the switch is turned on. The gain is usually between 70 and 80. That works well for me. Guide scope focal length should be set. Now we're going to go to dither settings at the very bottom. And once you get into the dither settings, this is where we really have to spend some time and break down what each one of these things actually means. Of course, the first thing you want to do is turn on the switch for dithering, otherwise none of this is going to work. Then we have our pixels. This is going to determine basically how far the stars move between every single photo. 10 pixels would be a substantial amount of motion. One pixel would be hardly any motion. But this is really going to depend on the focal length you use. Tonight I'm at 600 millimeters, so 10 pixels might be a big jump between every single photo. If I was at 200 millimeters though, 10 pixels might barely be noticeable. So you have to factor that into the equation. I'm normally between five and 10 pixels because ultimately I wanna get a lot of motion between every single photo for the best results. Moving down, we have stability with 0.6, 1, 2, 3, and 4 arc seconds. This ties into how accurate your guiding is. In other words, it will not let your camera take another photo until my guiding accuracy is below for arc seconds in this case. And in my experience, I have to wait up to 30 seconds before my guiding gets below four arc seconds of error. So I'd recommend everybody put this to four, that's the highest possible. And that just means you're gonna be wasting less time between each one of your DSLR's exposures. Moving down, we have settle time, and this ties in with stability. So once you get below four arc seconds of error, then you have to wait a total of three seconds, and I'll say, okay, things have been calm for three seconds, I'm gonna allow you now to take your next photo on the DSLR. Therefore, I'd recommend putting the settle time to either one or three seconds, that way you're not wasting even more time. The only caveat here is that if the settle time is one or three seconds and there's still a little bit of problems with your guiding and your camera begins taking the next photo, you might have blurry stars. So this is always kind of a back and forth. You have to figure out what works well for you. It's gonna probably change from night to night, especially depending on your focal length. But what you see here on screen, that's what I use and it works fairly well. The interval should be set to one, which is the default. That means after every single photo you take, the stars will move slightly, and then you'll begin taking your next photo. So again, leave the interval set to one. Most importantly, the RA only switch has to be turned on, because if you're on a SkyGuider Pro or Star Adventure, we only have an automated right ascension. If you don't have that checked, none of this is gonna work. So make sure you do that. And now we're finally ready to click over on the left to get out of our dither settings here, and continue on with our guiding. Let's click the looping arrows over on the right. That will begin taking photos with your auto guider in guide scope. And more than likely it's gonna be blurry when you start off, it's not a big deal. What you're gonna have to do is either slide the whole auto guider in and out of your guide scope to work on the rough focus, or if you can see some stars like you see here, you can turn the end of your guide scope one way or the other, wait to see if the stars get sharper, and keep doing that. You need to practice this on your own just to get the hang of it. But one of the problems I have is that my guide scope has been banged around so much on the road over the past couple years that I can no longer actually get sharp stars, unfortunately. Anyway, once you finally get the stars reasonably sharp, and in this case you can see how messed up mine are, you wanna click on a star that's not too bright because if you click on a really bright star, you're not gonna get the best guiding. The way the whole guiding process actually works is it tries to find the center of a star. So if you have this big bright white area, that's a lot more surface area that could be the center, and therefore you might not get the best guiding. So again, pick a star that's not quite the brightest, maybe like the one you see right here. If you have your green box around it, then you can click the crosshair button over on the right. That will begin the guiding. And because I'm using the Sky Guider Pro tonight, it says the deck guide is off. That's perfect. Otherwise, this wouldn't work. So I can hit confirm, and now what it's going to do is our calibration. This calibration should only take about two minutes. And while it's running, I'd like you to click the graph button over on the far left. Then it's gonna bring up our window here. 
deck mode is turned off, which you see there on the left as well. If it says deck mode auto or deck mode on, whatever, click that a couple times until it says deck mode off. And if it wasn't set to deck mode off originally, you might have to stop the calibration and restart everything. But if everything looks the way you see here, you can just click the graph button again to get rid of it. And now we're gonna sit and wait until we get to west step, whatever. Eventually it should go east step, let's say 15, 14, 13 and count down. And you'll notice that those yellow dotted lines are moving up from the star. At a certain point though, they're gonna turn around and go back to the center of the star. That's really all the calibration is doing. If you get an error here, or it just goes like west step 16 and never stops, that's probably because either your star tracker is not turned on, the cables are not properly connected, or you never went up to that telescope icon at the top of the screen and turned on the little switch. You need to do all those different things for this process to work properly. But if you've been following along closely with the video, you shouldn't have any issues. It's gonna go east step back to one zero. Those yellow dotted lines will turn green and we'll finally begin our guiding. At that point, we're about 90% done with the workflow. The only thing left is to set up the auto run and begin taking our images. There we go, we're officially guiding now. It even brought up the graph. What I'd like you to do is wait about 20 seconds for those blue and red lines to kind of stabilize towards the center. The red line, that's our declination. We really don't have any control over that in both the guiding and the dithering. So I don't worry about the red line. It really just kind of indicates if your polar alignment got thrown off mainly. And the blue line, that's gonna represent our RA. So that's really the one you wanna focus on is the blue line. But again, all I'm doing right now is just waiting for them to kind of stabilize a little bit. Once I see the blue right ascension line kind of stabilize, I'm gonna click the big arrow in the top left. That'll take me back to my main camera shooting window. And that's where we need to finish up with our workflow. So we'll click that big arrow on the top left. Now we're back in our main camera interface. And then we're gonna click preview over on the right in gold. We need to change that from preview to auto run. When you get into the auto run window, it's gonna look pretty much the same, but you wanna click the three dots and the three lines over on the right. That'll get you into your shooting schedule. From here, we can first name the target that we're photographing. This really doesn't have any bearing on your DSLR at all, but it doesn't hurt just to put whatever we're doing just so we stay organized, in this case, Andromeda. If you have a schedule already selected there over on the right, that box, I'm just gonna click the X to get rid of it. I don't want anything there. We're gonna start over fresh. So we'll delete the first sequence. And now we can click that big old plus button. This is what's gonna allow us to ultimately set up our camera. First, we have exposure. This is gonna be your shutter speed. And because we're guiding tonight, you can probably shoot up to three, maybe even four minutes or longer, but I'm gonna play it safe. And I'd like to shoot 70 seconds, but that's not actually an option. If you run into the same thing, you can click the box with a slash through it there on the right. And now you can manually input whatever shutter speed you want. Again, in my case, I'm gonna do 70 seconds. After we've set our shutter speed, leave the bin on one, repeat, that's how many photos we're gonna take. I think tonight I put this to about 60, that way I have just over an hour of total exposure time for Andromeda, that should be pretty good. But just like before, if you wanna do a value other than these presets, you can click the box with a slash through it and put your own manual value. Let's think about it. If we're only taking an hour's worth of exposure time, maybe some of those stars are gonna be blurry. So if I set it to 65, that gives me a little bit of leeway in case some of them are uh, blurry. These are gonna be light frames, so we'll hit okay. And that's really all there is to it. We're now taking 65 70 second photos. You can click the back arrow there in the top left. That'll get you back to the main interface. And now we're ready to begin taking our images, but there's a few last considerations. The first is our ISO. If I'm shooting 70 seconds, maybe I need to increase my ISO or lower my ISO depending on the amount of light pollution, my aperture, whatever. Now would be a good time to check that though. If we click the camera icon up at the top center of the screen, we can go in and we can change our ISO. Since my Nikon camera is ISO invariant, I can intentionally use a lower ISO and underexpose the photo to preserve that core detail in the Andromeda Galaxy or the Orion Nebula or whatever it is. If you're on Canon though, you're gonna generally wanna use a higher ISO, that way you don't have to brighten things in post as much because then you're gonna notice quality loss. If that all looks good though, we can click that circular button on the right to begin taking our photos. I had a two second delay, it's gonna count down. And now we begin the first of 65 photos. So I'm gonna cut the video now. Once our first image completes, we'll see how the dithering actually works. And here we go. So the first image just completed. 
it's not going to take another photo yet until the dithering takes place, but it will update the preview image here on the screen, and it should turn out pretty well, I think. Yeah, that looks better. You see there on the graph, we now have a big old dither. That means the star tracker and ultimately our camera have moved about 10 pixels roughly. Now what we're doing is sitting around waiting before we can take our next photo. This ties back in with the dither settings we explained earlier. It will not allow my camera to take another photo until my error there on the graph is four arc seconds or less. And this brings me to my big problem with dithering. There's a lot of wasted time. Remember, our number one goal at night is to capture as much light as possible. And yet here we are wasting 30 seconds, if not longer, before we can take another photo. So you can imagine if you're out there all night long, you might waste up to half of your night sitting here with nothing going on because the dithering is taking place and it won't allow your camera to take a photo until the guiding has calmed down enough. But there we go. Finally, we can now start taking our second photo. And that's really all there is to it. This process is going to repeat for the rest of the night until I've taken 65 photos. So I'll take a 70 second long photo, a dither command will be sent from the auto guider to my star tracker, the end result being that the stars will move either up or down in this case. Once the stars have moved a little bit, the guiding is going to wait until it settles down enough towards that center line. At a certain point though, it'll say, okay, it looks good enough. And then it'll tell my camera, hey, you can start taking your next photo. But I might have to wait 30 to 45 seconds or longer between those intervals, and that's a lot of wasted time. And when I was doing these tests last night, I gave it a full hour to capture images. Once that hour had passed, I went outside and stopped everything, and I realized I only captured 27 images in an hour. If I did the math correctly, that translates to about 30 minutes of light gathering capability, which means I wasted the other 30 minutes sitting around not taking photos because of the dithering. Another problem with this dithering is that if you're using a SkyGuider Pro or Star Adventurer, it's not real dithering. In other words, if you had a go-to mount that had an automated right ascension and declination axis, the stars would move kind of like in a spiral pattern randomly after every single photo. But since we only have an automated right ascension, that means the stars are only going to move in one direction, either up and down or left and right, not both at the same time. So between these two problems, I'm not really a big fan of dithering with the SkyGuider Pro or Star Adventurer, but now that you know how it works and you know some of the problems, Let's take a look at our photos, do some comparisons, and see if this was worth all the headache or not. We're going to start off this workflow in Adobe Bridge. This is a great way to get organized and find all your files, which I've got right here. And I don't think I mentioned this, but I took 27 photos with dithering turned on. After that completed, I took about 50 photos with no dithering whatsoever. That way we compare the results side by side and see if the dithering did anything whatsoever. What I'd like you to pay attention to now are the position of the stars. This was the very first of our dithering images. If I go down to the next image, see how they jump up and down like that? That's exactly what I want to see. We want movement between the stars in every single photo. That's what's ultimately going to smooth out and remove any problems caused by your camera's sensor. I was using a value of 10 pixels for our dither settings, and at 600 millimeters, that had a noticeable impact. You'll see just how far they jump after every single photo. And therefore, now that we know that 10 pixels causes a big jump at 600 millimeters, you can make your own conclusions. I definitely would not have wanted to use a lower value, otherwise the stars would barely move, and that would negate the whole uh, benefit here. Another thing that you should be noticing is that the stars only pretty much move up and down. They're not moving really to the left or the right necessarily. That's because we can only dither in right ascension, and in this case, that translates to the stars moving up or down, not left or right. So if you have a go-to mount, the stars would maybe move up and to the right in one photo, down to the left in another, whatever. You're going to have truly random motion. But in this case, they're just really moving up or down. A big problem that I should have caught last night is that my lens lost the sharp focus. After a little while, the stars were no longer sharp. This tends to happen on cold nights where the lens shrinks and it throws off your focus. And if we scroll down here, this was the last of the 27 photos. If I zoom in, you can see that the stars are no longer sharp. They're clearly out of focus. I should have went out every 15 or 20 minutes, stopped the interval, refocused the lens, and started over again. But I didn't. I was lazy. So when I started up my new sequence with no dithering applied, this time I refocused the lens right at the start and let it run for about 50 photos. And we're going to compare these two and see how they worked out. And if I zoom out here, again, these are the photos with no dithering applied. If we go from frame to frame, let me just sync all these settings real quick. But now if we go frame to frame with no dithering, 
the stars really don't move whatsoever. And that's kind of one of the problems that you have is that if you have color model or banding or whatever, then it's just going to get baked into the photo because the stars don't really move during the sequence of your images. So hopefully that explains why we're doing dithering and really what dithering is. It's just moving the stars between photos. Now let's take a look and see if it was worth all the hassle. So what I would normally do is some basic edits here. I cover this in my deep space course extensively. This is just kind of a quick run through I'm doing just to show you. But let's say that looked good to me. I mean, it looks a lot better than it did anyway. Then I would sync this with all my other photos. Once it's synced with all my photos, then I would save all these photos as high quality TIFF files, which you can do fairly easily. Again, I'm going through this fast because I'm assuming you know what you're doing, but you save these. And now that you've done that, we're gonna click done in the lower right after it's gone through and saved everything. At this point, once you have all your high quality TIFF files saved, you need to stack them. If you're on Mac, you can use Starry Sky Stacker. If you're on Windows, you can use Deep Sky Stacker. Or today I'm gonna to demo with Sequitor because this one works really well and it takes pretty much half the time, if not even faster than Deep Sky Stacker. All we have to do is double click Star Images, navigate to our TIFF folder that we just created. In this case, we'll do our no dithering images first. I took about 50 and I'll select all my photos. Next, I'll go down to the output and double click on it. This is where we're gonna name the file, which we'll call YouTube or whatever. All that's left is to click on accumulation down here and then choose select best pixels. This is gonna give you like a Sigma clipping. All that really means is it's gonna throw out the hot pixels, the planes, the satellites, whatever doesn't really belong in your photo. It's only gonna keep the galaxy or the nebula and the stars. So make sure you have select best pixels checked and you have the radius all the way to strict. That tends to work well. That's all there is to it. Then you can click start. That's why I love using Sequitor. It's easy, it's fast, and you don't have to mess around wasting a lot of time. The only downside with this stacking application is that it doesn't rate your images. So if you're using Starry Sky Stacker on the Mac or Deep Sky Stacker, it will automatically throw out any bad photos. In this case though, if you have a random photo that's blurry, it's gonna include it in your stack and potentially ruin your final image. Therefore, if you are using Sequitor, you wanna come into Adobe Bridge, go to your TIFF folder, and then just click on your first photo in your sequence. Over on the right, you're gonna have a preview window. You can click with a magnifying glass and it's gonna bring up a big crop. Then you can use the arrow keys on your keyboard to go one by one and just verify that all the stars are actually sharp. They should be because we were guiding, you shouldn't have any issues but occasionally one or two of the photos will be randomly blurry. I'm not seeing a problem, but if you did, you would right click and delete it and then restack your photos if you've already gone through and done it because Sequitor again, cannot throw out bad photos. The other applications will do it automatically. Anyway, once that's done, we'll go back here. It's completed our image and that looks pretty good to me. Now I can click open or head over to Photoshop, whatever I wanna do, and we can compare our images side by side. I've already got everything organized here in Photoshop. If you look closely in the lower right, we have three layers. First up is our baseline, that's the dithering, where I had 27 images stacked together. On top of that, I took another 27 photos with dithering turned off, and we got the photo right here. Finally, I took about 50 plus images with no dithering, and we have this image here. The reason I include that one is because, ideally, if you were out there for an hour, you'd have an hour's worth of data but because I had the dithering, it cut my total exposure time in half almost because there's just a lot of wasted time between photos. So this is just here to kind of show you that if you weren't screwing around with the dithering and just focusing on capturing light, how would that image have turned out? Would it look any better or worse than the dither? Now that we've explained all of our different layers, let's start off on our baseline. This is the dithered image. If I zoom in, the first thing I notice is that the stars are no longer sharp. And that's my big mistake from the night is I was too lazy to go out and double check the focus after 15 minutes, which I normally do. And therefore I've got blurry stars for most of the night. That won't really affect our demo today though, thankfully. So we're not really gonna worry about that. With my non dithered images, 27 of them, if I zoom in, stars are a lot sharper and overall it looks fairly good. You can see there's a lot of detail there. Again, this is only about a little over 30 minutes from a dark sky and it's really amazing which you can capture with a simple DSLR. Finally, we had our 50 plus images stacked together with no dithering. 
and we get this result. It's just a little bit cleaner, but you'd be hard pressed to really tell the difference. I'd have to be probably that close, and you can see that there's less grain, barely. But the more light you can capture, the more details and the cleaner your final image is gonna be. Unfortunately, with these tests, it's kinda hard to see anything going on at all, right? The image itself is very gray, it's flat, and there's not a lot of contrast. Also, this one is a little bit darker than the others for some reason. So let me just do a few little adjustments and try and get it looking the same brightness as the others. I think that'll work. Now what I'd like to do is really stretch these photos more than you probably should or would because we're trying to identify any problems and if they were fixed by the dithering. So just be clear here, I don't recommend you do these, but we're gonna do them today just for the heck of it. First, I'm gonna add a levels and really stretch this to bring out any problems. Again, I know it looks terrible, but that's kind of the whole point, isn't it? The first thing I notice on our dithered image is that the corners are oddly bright, and that's okay. The reason that the corners have these bright spots at the edges is because the stars moved after every single photo. When it line them all back up to a center point, you have a little bit of edging. Not a big deal, you can always just crop that in and never even know it was there. The next problem I notice is a vague purple glow here at the bottom of the frame. And if I add a saturation level, and layer, that'll make this a little bit more obvious. Again, I realize this looks terrible. At the bottom of the frame though, you can start to see that purple glow. That's a very normal problem for Nikon cameras. The only way to fix it, well, the best way to fix it is just to shoot longer exposures. And last night I was only shooting 70 seconds, but because I had the auto guider running, I could probably shot two, three, maybe even four minutes with sharp stars. And that's normally what I would have done. But because we are doing this dithering test, I wanted to accentuate the problems with my camera sensor, so I intentionally used a shorter exposure than I might have normally done. The next problem I notice is some color model over here on the right. It's kind of hard to see, but it's kind of like splotchy blues and reds and greens. You can kind of see it right here. That was what we were trying to get rid of by doing our dithering, because let's say there's a red splotch here and a green splotch over here. If the stars are moving around between each exposure with the dithering, when it lines it all back up, it should have just smoothed out all the colors and give us a flat background, but unfortunately we don't have that. And I would say that the reason we still have color model is because I only took 27 images, because I only had an hour to capture my data. If you had all night long, you could probably have taken 50, 100, maybe even more images, and that would have probably helped even more. But in this case, if you are running low on time, this just goes to show you that you might not really get any improvement from your dithering. Let's take a full screen look again. So we have three big problems. The first is the glowing edges, not a big deal. I can crop that out in no time at all. We have our purple glow, nothing really I can do about that other than take longer exposures, maybe take dark frames, but that might not have the best results. And then finally we have the color model, which that was the big thing I was hoping would get fixed with the dithering, it didn't. Of course, the image is also very grainy because we only took 27 images each 70 seconds. If I would've captured more light, there'd be less grain. So that means either longer total exposure time or longer individual photos. Okay, so we know what the dithered image looks like. Now let's take a look at an image with no dithering whatsoever. I realize the colors have shifted a little bit, but overall, it still gives us a good comparison. The first thing I notice is that there's a weird green color cast up here and over here. I'm not really sure what's causing that. I didn't notice any air glow necessarily last night. It could just be some random sensor problems. I can't quite rule out what was causing this. However, if we zoom in, I do notice a dust spot. That could have been fixed by the dithering because we don't see it down here. Or I could have taken flat frames or better yet just clean my sensor once in a while and I wouldn't have this dust spot. I'm also noticing a lot more color model up here. You can really start to see it now. We have like strands of green and splotches of red. Now you're probably really starting to see those problems. But with the dithered image, it is less noticeable, though it's tinted red, so it is kind of harder to see compared to the green. But we still have more or less the same problems. And if I look very closely, I even see some kind of like horizontal grain, which you could call like walking grain. This tends to happen. I rarely have it, but in this case, it's definitely there. I can still almost see it, though, in the dithered images, too, which, again, should have fixed that problem. So... This could be an issue with the stacking or the camera sensor itself, but either way, uh, overall, this doesn't look that great. This was only 27 images with no dithering whatsoever versus 27 images with dithering. Finally, we have 
50 images stacked together with no dithering. And now you're really starting to see some of these like horizontal lines throughout the photo. Again, I've done a lot of work lately and I don't ever recall seeing this problem. So this is something new and it's kind of odd that it's happening tonight, but there's 50 images versus 27. There's not really a difference in the grain as much as I would have liked considering I have almost double the total exposure time. And the image now has more of a red color cast compared to the green. None of these color casts are a big deal though. You can fix them fairly easily here in Photoshop or whatever application you want to use. Before we go, I wanted to give you some realistic expectations of how these images would turn out because we are just focusing on the really ugly aspects. But the image we're looking at here, this is my final version of about 50 images with no dithering whatsoever. Just doing things the old fashioned way. Take a bunch of light frames, stack them together, do some edits here in Photoshop, and you get this final result. This is the way I normally do things. And if we zoom in, it looks great. You can even see like these dust lanes getting sucked up into the core of the Andromeda galaxy. This is a lot of fun to look at. There is still a bit of grain, which is to be expected. This was only about an hour with a stock Nikon D750 and a fairly slow lens. It was like F 6.3. So not a lot of light coming in here. Overall though, I think that looks like a great image and I'd be happy with that. Let's move on though to our dithered image and it looks nowhere near as good. I wanna stress here a couple points though. Try to ignore the big bright stars. That's my fault. It's got nothing to do with the dithering. I just did not go out and refocus the lens after a couple minutes, which I should have. So try to ignore that and just focus on the galaxy itself. If we compare that though, it's still almost a night and day difference. There's a lot of purple glow you can kind of see down here that's not visible. Remember, this is ones where we didn't do any dithering, oddly enough, and this is with the dithering. I tried to keep the edits as close as possible, although of course there are a few minor changes, but at the end of the day, if we zoom in here, see how much more grainy it looks? That's really the big problem. Because I was doing the dithering, I was only able to capture about 30 minutes of data within an hour. Whereas without the dithering, I was able to take images that entire hour and I got a much cleaner final result if we compare these side by side. And that really brings me to my final word today. And that is, in my experience, fairly limited anyway, with dithering, I do not think it's worth the extra headache, the extra hassle, because we're essentially cutting our night in half. And ultimately that translates to more grain in your photo because we have less light. So for me personally, I'm probably not gonna worry about dithering anymore now that I've done these tests. I don't really think it's a viable thing to do if you have a Skyguider Pro or Star Adventure. However, I wanna stress that just because I got these results doesn't mean you're gonna get the same results. Every single camera performs differently. Every star tracker performs differently if you're using filters or if you're in more light pollution, whatever it is, we're all shooting under different scenarios. And that's why I don't want you to take my word for this. Don't take anybody else's word for it online. It's gonna change for you because you have a very unique scenario, we all do. And with that said, I'd like you to still go out, practice with the dithering, give it a shot, see if it works for you. Probably one thing that would really help is rather than only spending an hour, try for two or three. You'll probably notice more benefits from the dithering if you're able to capture more total exposure time. In my case, I only had an hour. And that's why the results probably weren't as good as they could have been. All right, well, that's about all I've got for you in today's video. If you want to learn even more about astrophotography, you can head over to my website. I've got a bunch of different courses available on there, whether you want to learn more about deep space or Milky Way photography or how to use your star track or whatever it is. I guarantee these courses will make your life a lot easier moving forward and it'll cut your learning curve down for maybe a couple months or years to just a few weeks if you can get out and practice. I've also got a Patreon page for just 10 bucks a month that has completely separate content you won't find anywhere else. And with new videos being added every month, it's a pretty good deal. My final word today is that I'd like you to go out and test your own camera and your own star tracker and everything, because we're all shooting under different scenarios, even if that just means the different amount of light pollution, it's gonna affect the way these images turn out. And just because you saw it here on my video that the dithering didn't quite work out that well, it doesn't mean that's not gonna be the same result for you. You might get completely different results, especially, again, if you're able to capture two or three hours worth of data, you might notice a much more substantial impact. And that's always gonna be my best recommendation is don't take my word for it or anybody else's word for it online because ultimately your scenario is completely unique to you based on your camera sensor, your star tracker, the filters you're using and more. So now that you know how to do dithering, go out, give it a try and see how it works for your scenario.